Alex Sasser here hosting another episode of Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. We are so glad you tuned in today and want to make you aware of some great resources available from this ministry. The free Touching Lives app is available on both Apple and Android smartphones and through the Amazon App Store, Roku, and Apple TV. Go to touchinglives.org slash apps to learn more. Next, start your day in the Word of God using the daily devotional email from Touching Lives. You can register right now at touchinglives.org slash devotionals to begin receiving your daily email. And finally, be sure to sign up for Dr. Merritt's monthly Bible teaching letter. This letter is delivered for free in print right to your mailbox each month. Go to our website at touchinglives.org slash letter to register today. Thank you again for joining us. And now here is today's sermon from Dr. James Merritt. Well, I want to say good morning to all of those who are here at our Sugarloaf campus, to those who are at our Mill Creek campus, those who are watching online, and there are many of you and growing, and those who are watching by television, thanks for being a part of what we're talking about today. It was one of the great honors of my life. I didn't expect it, and it, was, it left me with a picture that, as they say, is worth a thousand words. This is a photograph of me standing next to my two oldest sons, James and Jonathan. We're standing next to the 41st President of the United States, George H.W. Bush. We had been invited to a, a luncheon downtown in Atlanta. He was campaigning for someone running for governor. And frankly, to this day, I don't know how in the world I got invited not only to the luncheon, but my sons and I actually got to sit at the next little round table right next to President Bush. Because as you can imagine, normally those seats are reserved for donors and, and people with political influence and connections and people with a lot of money. In other words, not people like me. Now, there was absolutely nothing that I could give to President Bush or anyone else in return for the honor and the privilege of having a seat at that table. I didn't ask for the invitation. I, I hadn't done anything to earn it. I didn't deserve it. I was there simply because of grace. That's all. And I received something, in other words, from someone that I didn't deserve. Which brings us to perhaps the most beautiful illustration of grace in the Old Testament, and frankly, one of the most one of the most beautiful pictures of grace in all of the Bible. And if you want to look on with me today, and you brought a copy of God's Word or whatever it is you might use, we're in a book called Second Samuel, chapter nine. It's right after First Samuel. If you don't know where that is, go to Genesis and turn right, go about six or eight books, and you'll hit Second Samuel, chapter nine. If you are here for the first time, we are in a series on King David. We're calling it Life Lessons from a King. It's been one of the most fascinating studies I've ever done, one of the most enjoyable studies that I've ever done. And we're, we've been stepping back into a time tunnel of about 3,000 years. And today, as we read the story, keep in mind that David is at the very height of his power. His kingdom was not the biggest in the world, but it was the only one that was absolutely invincible. So here's David, He's a, still a relatively young man. He's at the very apex and zenith of his life. And through his leadership, Israel has grown to 10 times its original size. They had never known a military defeat. The economy is booming. There is meat on every plate. There's a chariot in every garage. There are grapes on every vine. And the twin rivers of peace and prosperity are flowing right down the countryside. David's approval rating was 100%. Israel is eating out of the palm of his hand, and he could do anything he wanted to do. But today, his mind is not on politics, it's not on the economy, it's not on the budget, it's not on the kingdom, it's not what, what, what more buildings can I build or what more lands can I conquer. Today, his mind is fixed on one particular family. So he calls all of his officials and all of his servants together, and he asks this question, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul? Now before David finished that question, everybody thought they knew where David was going. Because back in the day, whenever a new dynasty came into power, it was just kind of a customary thing that the family of the previous king would either be exiled or more likely be executed. 
because there was always the threat of revolution against the new king, and so they wanted any threat to the throne to be eliminated. And besides that, everybody knew that, uh, as you've, we've learned in this series, Saul and David were not exactly the best of friends. As a matter of fact, Saul had made David public enemy number one. And until the end of his life, Saul had tried to kill David. So David asked a question that most any king would have asked in his position. Hey, by the way, is there anybody left of the guy, anybody left of the family of the guy that I just took over from? Anybody left of his? But they were shocked when he finished the question. Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? The Hebrew word there for kindness is the Hebrew word chesed. It's one of the most frequently used in all of the Old Testament, and it may be the most beautiful word in the Old Testament. It's often referred to as the primary characteristics of God in, in, in the Old Testament, and it's basically the counterpart part to the New Testament word grace. So it's kind of an equivalent. Is there anyone that I could show grace to in Saul's family? So here's David once again. We understand why he's a man after God's own heart because he is reflecting the heart of God. If you could do open heart surgery on God, if that were possible, you would find a heart full of grace. See, this is not your you know, kind of run-of-the-mill human kindness David is talking about. As a matter of fact, he clarifies this in, in, in verse 3. He says, is there no one still alive from the house of, of, of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? I don't want to be just kind in a human way. I, I want to show this family member or members, whoever they might be, I want to show them the kindness of God. In other words, here's what David was really asking. Is there someone in the family of Saul that I can give the same grace to that God has given to me? And notice, he didn't just simply say, like, well, wait a minute now. Let me put it this way. Is there somebody qualified? Is there somebody, somebody deserving? Is there somebody that's earned it? Or is there somebody out there of Saul's family that if I do something for them, they can do something for me? He just said, is there anybody? Is there anybody out there that even though they've not earned it, they don't deserve it, I don't have to do it, they can't do anything for me, is there anyone out there that I can show the kindness and the grace of God? And so the story revolves around a man with one of the weirdest names you will ever hear. You probably never heard it before. His name was Mephibosheth. And I'm not making that up. That was the kid's name, Mephibosheth. Now, let's be honest. You either have to be drunk or in a bad mood to name a kid Mephibosheth. Because not only is it a bad name, Mephibosheth, I mean, who wants to be nicknamed Fibber, right? So when you look at any story in the Bible, and we will look at this story, you always need to answer three questions. Number one, why is it in the Bible? And this is a good question to ask. So why is this story even in the Bible? Number two, where is God in this story? You always want to ask that question. And then number three, where am I in this story? Now, here's what you're going to see. In David, you're going to see a picture of the Savior, Jesus. In Mephibosheth, you're going to see a picture of the sinner, you and me. And then in the entire story, you're going to see the picture of salvation. And what you're going to see is why God's grace is so amazing. Listen to what David does for Mephibosheth, and it's a perfect picture of the grace of God. Number one, because of grace, God approaches me. Because of grace, God approaches me. Now, in answer to David's question, a servant steps forward and he volunteers this information. Now, there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, Well, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Now, keep in mind if, that the very name Mephibosheth means a shameful thing. 
And there's a reason for that. Even his name is going to clue us in that this guy, this Mephibosheth, Saul's son, he, he's, he's really in a, uh, actually his grandson, he's really in a bad way. He is in a shameful condition because remember, he was of the house of Saul. Now Saul was a mortal enemy of David. And so from the time he was born, the culture and the society would have said, okay, you better hide because you are an enemy of David. You were born into the wrong family. You've been corrupted from the time that you were born. Well, how's that like us? We were all born in one sense into the wrong family. We were all corrupted by birth. We were all born on the wrong side of the tracks. You say, what do you mean? We were all born imperfect. We were all born unlike God. We were all born to go our own way, not God's way. We're, we're, we're not imperfect by choice. We're imperfect by nature. The reason why we choose to do wrong things sometimes is because we were born with this natural propensity to do the wrong thing. Because there's one thing that comes naturally to everybody who's ever born, and that's what the Bible calls sin. In other words, we do what we do. Because we are what we are. We sin because we are sinners. We are not sinners because we sin. And go back again to answer and and listen to how Ziba answers this question when he says, when David says, okay, who's who's in Saul's family that I can show kindness to? Listen to what Ziba says. There's still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Now, the reason why Mephibosheth is, is, is handicapped in this way is because when word came back when he was a little boy that Saul and Jonathan had been killed, the, the, the servants that were in the house taking care of, 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 uh, of Mephibosheth said, okay, we're in trouble. Now that Saul is dead and Jonathan is dead, we're the ones left in the family of Saul. David will come after us. He's going to kill us. And so the, the, his servant picks Mephibosheth up. He's five years old. She picks him up. She begins to run away with him, but somehow she dropped him. He landed awkwardly, and because of that, he permanently injured both of his feet. Now, the important thing is this. Why does Ziba add that comment? Why, why would she even say that? Why she didn't just say Mephibosheth? She said no. His, 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 she called his name Mephibosheth, but then she said, oh, by the way, he's lame in both feet. Because she wanted David to know what he was getting into. See, he couldn't come to David. David had to come to him. He he couldn't approach David on his own because you cannot come to the king without an invitation. So in other words, if there's ever going to be any relationship between Mephibosheth and David, David had to make the first move. David had to initiate the contact. David had to give the invitation. Now up front, we already know something. There's not one thing that David can do for Mephibosheth, that Mephibosheth can do for David, David will have to do everything for Mephibosheth. But there's more. David asked another question. He said, well, where is he? And Ziba answered, he is at the house of Maker, son of Amiel in Lodabar. Now, it's amazing how the Bible is so descriptive of of certain stories, and there's a lot of description here. We're told that he is in Lodabar. You know what the word Lodabar means? It means a place of no pasture. In other words, what that really means is, oh, uh, he's living on the backside of a trailer park out in the country that you really can't get to from here. He's on the backside of a desert. He is all alone, all by himself. So here was the grandson of a former king living in the middle of nowhere. He was not who he could have been. He didn't have what he should have had. He is a nobody going nowhere in a hurry. And not only did he not have any reason to ever think that of all people, the king would come knocking on his door. The truth of the matter is he didn't want the king knocking on his door except to put him out of his misery. That would be the only reason the king would show up. He was a lot more concerned about a spear through his neck or a sword through his heart than he was about David showing up. But the unthinkable did happen. The king leaves the throne and approaches Mephibosheth just the way God approaches us, all because of grace. You remember this. You don't come to God first. God comes to us first. And it's all because 
of grace. But let me tell you, this story just gets better and better and better. See, because of grace, God approaches us. God approaches me. But because of grace, God accepts me. He doesn't approach me. He accepts me. Now, it's been 20 years since David became king. And it appears that Mephibosheth has been kind of living and hiding in fear for his life. He didn't just happen to move to this place called Lodabar. He thought, well, the king will never come here. Nobody will ever find me here. I can at least be safe here. And then came that day he had been dreading all of his life, the day he had nightmares about. There was a knock on his door with trembling hands on his hands and knees. He crawls toward the door and he opens it. And sure enough, his worst nightmare has come true. There's no mistake, mistaking who this is. This is not an insurance salesman. These are the king's officials. And who knows if he was more scared or relieved, but it didn't matter. He figured he was looking death right in the face. And there was no way that he could have ever anticipated what is about to happen because here's what's about to happen. He is about to get not what the culture of that day say he deserved, not what the unwritten law of the land say that he deserved, not what society would say that he deserved. He was about to get the one thing he did not deserve. Because the one thing that Mephibosheth needed was not justice. He didn't even need mercy. Mercy would have just left him alone in his miserable condition. He needed grace. So listen to what happens in this, these next words. So King David had him brought from Lodibar, from the house of Maker, son of Amiel. He had him brought from Lodibar, from the house of Maker, son of Amiel. Now, once again, as a reminder, it wasn't Mephibosheth that came after David. It was David that came after Mephibosheth. See, the sheep never seeks the shepherd. The shepherd seeks the sheep. And if you ever come to a place where you say, you found God, I got news for you. It was because God first found you. When you start looking for God, it's because you all of a sudden realize God has been looking for me. And so now he finally hears these words. He had been dreading for two decades. Mephibosheth, the king wants to see you. And Mephibosheth probably thought, yeah, um, I know. I knew this day was coming. But notice again, he had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Maker, son of Amiel. I'm sure he thought that they would make him crawl every single step of the way to the palace. He probably couldn't believe his eyes when he saw this beautiful gleaming chariot decked out with cushioned seats, an umbrella, water, warm bread. He's thinking, what in the world's going on? Is this the way I'm going to my execution? Is this the way I'm going to be hung? Is this the way I'm going to be beheaded? Because think about it now. Mephibosheth hadn't been treated like this since he was a kid. And he's thinking, surely the king knows I'm crippled. Surely the king knows I'm broken. Surely the king knows I've got nothing to offer him except lame legs. But the king is accepting him just the way he is. What a beautiful picture of the way God comes to us because I don't know how you think you came to God. Let me tell you how we all came to God. When, God, when, when, when we came to God, we were not worthy of coming to God, which is why God comes to earth first. And God came to us when we were dirty. And God didn't demand that we clean up first. God brings us to his home and he cleans us up. God comes to us when we're messed up. And he doesn't wait until we get our act together. He says, listen, I'm going to bring you to my house and I'm going to get your act together. Now remember, this was before handicapped ramps and designated parking places, motorized wheelchairs. I mean, when David found out this kid, this kid was crippled, this man was crippled, this kid was lame, David could have easily said, um, does he have any brothers and sisters? Is there anybody else I can show kindness to? I mean, what does Mephibosheth have? He has no wealth. He has no education. He has no training. I mean, simply put, he has nothing to offer to the king, to the queen. He doesn't even have anything to offer to the lowliest servant in the palace. 
But David accepts him just the way he is. And I want you to listen to hear anything else. I don't know what your past has been. I don't know what your present looks like. I don't know what you did last night. I don't care what you did a week ago. I don't care. I don't care if you've got a police record six miles long. God accepts us and God loves us just as we are. But the story gets still better. Because of grace, God approaches me. God comes to me. God makes the first move. Because of grace, God accepts me. Knowing all of my faults, all of my foibles, all of my flaws, and all of my failures, all the darkness and all the blackness and all the skeletons in my closet, God accepts me just the way I am. Now, that would be good enough, right? You say, man, let's go home. You can't. Because it gets still better. Because of grace, God not only approaches me. And because of grace, God not only accepts me. Watch this. Because of grace, God adopts me. God adopts me. Now, the moment comes. Mephibosheth is brought before the one man who's going to decide whether he lives or whether he dies. I mean, wouldn't you have loved to have been at that moment? He's shaking like a leaf. He's looking for the bathroom. He, he is absolute. I mean, his stomach is in a knot. His blood pressure is off the, chain, off the chart. <clears throat> He's about to hyperventilate. His heart is racing. He thinks, surely this must be the end. And then comes this tear-jerking scene. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, i.e., the mortal enemy of David, the one who could have been in line for the throne, a threat to the kingdom. The son of Saul came to David. He bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. I mean, what else is he going to say? At your service. Now listen to this. Don't be afraid. Do you think those are the first words he thought David would say to him? Don't be afraid. No, he was expecting David to say, is your will made out? Are you ready to die? How do you want it? He says, don't be afraid, David said, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I would imagine that Mephibosheth had already kind of gotten on his knees kind of bowed his head. He's kind of waiting for the executioner's sword to fall. He's just known that he's, he's knowing, knowing that he's just about to breathe his last. And then he hears David said, don't be afraid. His head jerks up. His eyes are wide as saucers. His ears are on high alert. He, he can't believe what he just heard. I mean, he certainly never expected the first thing he would hear out of the mouth of the king was, don't be afraid. You know what though? That's just like Jesus. That's just like Jesus. That's why Jesus is a descendant of David and David is an ancestor of Jesus because are you aware? I bet you may not be. Did you know that the most repeated command from the lips of Jesus was fear not? The number one command that Jesus asked us to obey is fear not. As a matter of fact, did you know that the command of God to not be afraid, listen to this, it is the only command that appears in every book of the Bible, the only one. In all 66 books, somewhere you will find either the phrase fear not or do not be afraid in every book of the Bible. But you're Mephibosheth, so you're wondering, wait a minute, is David bluffing? Is, is he playing some kind of a sadistic game? Is, is he kind of just setting him up for the kill? I mean, do, does he really mean, hey, don't worry, it won't hurt very long? No. His hand extended to, Mephib to Mephibosheth does not hold a sword that kills. It holds a grace that heals. Now, why? Why is he choosing to be so gracious to Mephibosheth. 
Because let me remind you one more time. Had Mephibosheth earned this kindness? No. Did Mephibosheth deserve this kindness? No. Did Mephibosheth buy this kindness? No. Was there anything Mephibosheth could do to work for this kindness? No. Then why in the world was David so kind, so gracious, so loving, so accepting of a cripple who could do nothing for him and who he owed nothing to? Listen carefully. For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Now this is so important. Listen carefully. This is the, this is the real crux of this story. David did not do this for Mephibosheth. David did not do this for Saul. David didn't even do this for David. He did it for Jonathan. I am showing you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Now I want to ask you a question. Pop quiz. Ready? Why does God show us grace? Why does God forgive us of our sins? Why does God give us mercy instead of judgment? It's not, 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 not. It is not because of what we do for him. It's because of what Jesus, his son, has done for us. Not because of what we do for him, but because of what Jesus has done for us. Now, even here, we still can't stop the story and say, well, and Mephibosheth lived happily ever after. Because there's still one other thing David says. Now, listen to this. He says, I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Do you see that phrase, eat at my table? That is a big deal in this story. And you say, well, how do you know it's a big deal in the story? Well, anytime something is repeated in, in Scripture, it's always a big deal. When it's repeated more than once, when it's repeated more than twice, but when it's repeated more than three or four times, it is a big deal. And in this story, in this chapter, that phrase is repeated four times. The king tells Ziba, who's now assigned to be Mephibosheth's full-time servant, okay, he says, and Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then we read down in verse 13. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. But the most telling way that it's used is in verse 11. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table. How did he eat at David's table? Why did he eat at David's table? Like one of the king's sons. Now, do you understand what's just happened here? David has not just approached Mephibosheth. David has not just accepted Mephibosheth. David has adopted Mephibosheth. He said, son, my home is now your home. My family is now your family. You don't just visit here, you live here. Why? All because of Jonathan. Not because of you, not even because of me, but all because of Jonathan. And because of Jonathan, Mephibosheth now has fellowship with the king. For Mephibosheth now has the fortune of the king. And Mephibosheth is now a part of the family of the king. I want to give you a newsflash. It's all because of Jesus that we can have fellowship with God. It is all because of Jesus that we have the fortune of God. It's all because of Jesus that we're now a part or can be a part of the family of God. Of God. See, we've got a seat at the table. And just like lame, disabled Mephibosheth, who couldn't believe it, can you imagine the first time he went to eat, the first time the dinner bell rang? 
He walks in and he, he can't believe it. There's David's beautiful daughter, Tamar. There's his handsome son, Absalom. And then comes walking in the brilliant heir to the throne, the PhD, the scholar, Solomon. He can't believe it. He's sitting next to the king, to Absalom, to Solomon, to Tamar. He's got a seat at the table. And just like, just like Mephibosheth, one of these days, we can have a seat at the table. And we can see it sit right next to Abraham and Noah and Moses and Joseph and Daniel and David and Paul and Peter and James and John. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Why? All because of Jesus. All because of grace. So I want to close with something. Somebody sent this to me over 20 years ago, and I've never used it until now. And the reason why, when, when somebody sent this to me, they emailed it to me. When I read it, I remember I, I said to myself, there's only one story in the Bible that needs to have that illustration. And I'm not going to use that illustration until I preach on this story. Well, this is the story and here is what I want you to listen to. And I want you to listen, draw up closer and listen. The, the story is called Come to the Table. And it goes like this. And as I begin to read it to you, imagine in your mind right now, you're walking into a restaurant. That's all I want you to do. You are walking into a restaurant. All right? Listen to these words. I shook my head in disbelief. This couldn't be the right place. After all, I couldn't possibly be welcomed here. I, I glanced down at the invitation, and, and there it was. It said, come as you are, no jacket required. I, I went to the address, and there was this beautiful, beautiful restaurant. A and I looked through the window, and I saw a room of people whose, races, who, whose faces were alight with joy. They, they were neatly dressed. They were adorned in the finest clothes. They appeared to be as clean as the driven snow. And I looked down at my own tattered and torn clothing, covered in stains, and I was dirtier than my clothes were. I even smelled bad. I, I, I said to myself, I don't belong here. Th this place is not for me. But the words of the invitation just jumped out at me. Come as you are. So I decided to give it a shot. Mustering up every bit of courage I could, I opened the door to this beautiful restaurant. And I walked to it to a man standing behind a podium. He said, your name? I said, James Merritt. I couldn't even look him in the eye. I was so ashamed of my appearance. He, he didn't seem to notice the filth I was covered in. He said, oh, yes. Uh, there's a table for you and a seat with your name on it. Uh, for me? Yes, for you. He led me to a table. And sure enough, there was this beautiful place card with my name written on it in deep, dark red. I, I looked over the menu, and I couldn't believe what they were serving. Things like peace and joy, and love, and mercy, and blessings. I, I quickly realized this, this was the ordinary restaurant. I, I flipped the menu to the back, uh, back to the, to, to the front of the order to see what the name of the restaurant was. And, and it was called God's Grace. Well, the waiter returned and he said, may, may I recommend the special of the day and you can accept it and, if, and, and everything that you've read on the menu is yours and you can have as much as you want. And I said, well, of course, what is the special of the day? He said, salvation. <laughs> I practically screamed out, I'll take it. Then I snapped back to reality. Tears filled my eyes. I said, mister, I'm, I, I'm sorry. I mean, you, you can see I'm, I'm dirty. I'm nasty. I'm unclean. I'm unworthy. I'm completely broke and completely broken. I, I, I would love to have all of this, but, sir, I, I can't afford it. And the man smiled again, and he said, uh, Sir, your, your check has already been taken care of by that gentleman over there, as he pointed to a man in the front of the room. I said, Who is that? He said, His name is Jesus. 
I, I immediately ran over to this man and I fell at his feet. And I said, sir, I'll, I'll wash the dishes. I'll sweep the floor. I'll take out the trash. You, you just name it. And whatever I can do to repay you for all of this, I'll do it. He brought me to my feet. He said, son, all of this is your, yours just for coming to me. You, you don't need to clean up. I'm going to clean you up. You, you don't need to pay for the food. It has already been bought. You don't need to buy any clothes. I've already picked out your outfit. All you've got to do is accept what I want to give you. And then he said something to me I will never forget. He said, James, you need to understand, you're not just a customer at my restaurant. You are now a part of my family. What I have is yours. Come and go as you like. Just remember, you will always have a seat at my table. And so it is with Jesus. So it is, whether you're a nine-year-old boy like I was in a movie theater, or you're a 25-year-old man sitting in prison on a drug charge, or you're an 18-year-old high school senior young lady, and you're totally lost and confused, and you don't even know why you're on this earth. There is a God in heaven. He created you. He conceived you. He wants to convert you, and He is calling you. And he simply is saying today, I've got a restaurant that's open. You're invited to come. When you come into this restaurant, you're going to eat like you've never eaten before. And you can have all you want. Peace, joy, forgiveness, happiness, eternal life. It all comes included in the main course, which is salvation. It's all been bought. It's all been paid for. And if you'll accept it, I will accept you. I will adopt you. And you will always have a seat at my table. We are so glad you tuned in here on the Touching Lives digital channel, and we hope you enjoyed the sermon today. Be sure to click and follow this page and feel free to leave any comments below. We'd love to hear your thoughts from today's message. Look for a new episode to be posted on this channel each Sunday. And in the meantime, feel free to call us at 800-413-1131 or email us at info at touchinglives.org with prayer needs or questions. Thank you so much for watching today. I'll see you right here next time for another episode of Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. Touching Lives, teaching people everywhere who Jesus is and why they need Him. This program is sponsored by Touching Lives Ministries and is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.